I'm Sophie Wilson. Um, I'm currently a research fellow at Broadcom where I design microprocessors. Previously I've written a lot of software and designed computers but I'm most well known for designing the instruction set of the Acorn RISC machine, the processor beca that became ARM which has sold billions and billions and billions and is in your phone, in your tablet, all through your house infrastructure in, in every um, piece of internet e equipment. And I also designed the BBC computer, um, both co-designing its hardware and I wrote the BBC Basic Interpreter in it and designed the operating system. So I grew up in a house where my parents had made virtually everything. My dad made the furniture, he built a car, boats, um, my mum made the clothes and as all the children grew up we started to participate in the building of stuff. My dad was an English teacher and my mum a physics teacher. Um, my mum's uh, school didn't have a lot of money to spend on equipment so one of the cost saving measures was we built it all. The whole family would sit around the dining room table and we would build oscilloscopes or multimeters or other types of physics equipment, particularly all the equipment to teach people about electronics. Yeah, starting off with kits, I went on to build radios and hi-fi systems and, and stuff. <laughs> um, so when microprocessors started to come out, I started building things with those. I mean, what do you get if you mix an English teacher with a physics teacher? You, you get a, a set of children who are good at maths, that's what you get. So we all did maths very well, um, so I did the entrance exams to Cambridge and got onto the Cambridge maths course. And then it all went very sadly wrong. I didn't turn out to be good at university maths, unlike my siblings, so I failed and had a desperate search for something else to do. And that, that turned out to be doing a one-year computer science course, but at the same time, obviously working for what became Acorn Computers and, and designing a lot of new computer hardware and software. So before microprocessors, uh, I did a lot of things using digital logic, and I began to specialise a little bit in low power logic, what, what was at the time called um, COSMAC, but is now called CMOS, complementary metal oxide silicon. I specialised in that and the, the, the word got round that there was somebody who knew about low, low power logic and it was me. So Herman Hauser, the founder of Acorn and now a venture capitalist and um, so on is not a particularly well organised person. So he wanted what what you nowadays think of as the calendar function on your smartphone. Um, he wanted an electronic pocketbook that he could carry around with him that would have all his appointments and reminders when he had to be somewhere. So he, he, you know, he wanted to carry it around so it had to be battery powered so he knew it needed low power componentry and everybody said I was the person to find. So he came and found me and recruited me to build that. And I, in those days I kept a portfolio of designs. So when I was showing him progress on his electronic pocketbook design, he saw that I had other designs in my portfolio and one of them was for a single board computer and he said, could you build that? And I said, of course. <laughs> And that, that became Acorn System 1. So th this is um, a, a time before widespread microprocessors. So microprocessors existed and they were mostly of interest to industrial people. The BBC had made several programmes predicting that microprocessors would become significant in people's lives. This, this became very interesting to a bit of the BBC, the Continuing Education Department, which decided that if microprocessors truly were coming, then part of their remit as an education department would be that they'd have to inform people about it and tell them what, what was coming. So the basic sort of general messages they wanted to get over were you could program computers, computers could handle all sorts of things like paint pictures, draw graphs, 
um, do, do text, word processing, and the BBC wanted to make sure people knew about this. So out of continuing education came the computer literacy problem. They would teach people about computers. And at the time, there was no standard computer. Um, the, all, all the computers were all different. And there was very little that was available, particularly at the sort of price people might want to afford. So the BBC went round talking to manufacturers in the UK, looking for computers that might be nudged to fit. And so Chris Curry at Acorn got wind of this. Acorn had not been approached by the BBC at all, but Chris uh, followed up on some contacts and told the BBC that they should come and see what Acorn was doing. Um, at the time, Acorn wasn't doing anything much. Um, we'd had a lot of success in industrial control and some strange hobbyist markets with our system range and a little tiny bit of success with the Acorn Atom, our, our very first home computer. And we wanted to do something um, that was better than it, all of that. But various people in the company wanted different actual things. So Chris Cohen wanted another better home computer. Herman Hauser um, wanted a, an office automation computer. He got deeply into that. Andy Hopper, um, wanted a scientific workstation computer. And I broke that logjam by saying, OK, we'll design a multiprocessor computer, a computer that's built and sold in parts, um, which has parts specialised for each thing. So the BBC microcomputer itself fulfils Chris Curry's needs for a home computer, um, but you can plug onto it a language processor that specialises it for office automation or a different type of language processor that specialises it for a scientific workstation. And at last we had internal agreement about what we would do, but we hadn't done any of it by the time Chris Curry invited the BBC to come and see it. On Sunday night, uh, after Chris had arranged this and told Herman, um, Herman Hauser rang both Steve Ferber and myself. Talking to me, he said, Steve has agreed um, that although we've got nothing at the moment, we shall give it a go and build um, the impossible machine this week. And both of us said, that's impossible. Um, and both of us were told, well, Steve, in my case, um, thinks it is possible. Um, so we both agreed. I mean, obviously, when we got to work on Monday morning, um, we discovered that Herman had been um, feeding us a line, uh, but we still gave it a go. So between starting on Monday and the BBC coming on Friday morning, uh, we had to draw a real circuit diagram of the I.O. part of the Proton, our, our project code name for what became the BBC microcomputer was Proton. So we had to get the circuit diagram drawn um, and get all the components. Many of the components didn't really exist at the time. Uh, the DRAMs that make the BBC microcomputer function were sort of fresh off the page of an advanced data sheet. And a Hitachi executive carried the only four in the entire uh, European continent to us. So starting Wednesday, we built it. Thursday was debugging day. Late on Thursday night, well, uh, two o'clock on Thursday morning, I said, I I if this thing is ever going to work, uh, it will need some software. And I'll be writing that software. And I'm no shape to write software at the moment, because we've not got a lot of sleep that week. Um, so I went home and came back in at 8 o'clock after some very uneasy sleep, but at least some sleep, um, and found a working prototype machine and I speedily ported the Acorn machine operating system to it and a copy of BBC Basic. At the time, we didn't have drivers at all written for, for the machine, so things like the graphics display didn't work. Um, so typing blind in BBC Basic, I programmed the graphics display to work. And by the time the BBC got upstairs 
to see the prototype, it was displaying a black and white screen with a random pixel moving around it, all, all powered by Beauty Basic. Uh, I think the BBC actually did know that we had nothing at the beginning of the week, and so to see a working prototype that had got further than any of their other suppliers uh, must have impressed them a little bit. The BBC have been impressed by the prototype and wanted to work with us, so they contracted Acorn to finish the implementation of the Proton and to build what became the BBC Micro. Um, and I, sp I suppose the, the only friction there is they wanted us to produce 12,000 machines. Steve and I thought mm, 50,000 would be more like it. I think we sold a million and a half in the end. Well, it was a massive cadre of people in the UK who came up using machines like the BBC Micro or the other home computers that existed and were skilled. And that did lead to quite a few UK-based industries, um, I mean, most famously ARM, but also Argonaut Technology and several others that became really quite successful um, successfully enough to be bought by other companies. My name's Evan Upton. Uh, I'm one of the founders of Raspberry Pi, uh, and I'm an alumnus of the computer science department. Raspberry Pi is the coming together of really two strands of my life. Uh, one of them is my long-standing interest that dates all the way back to my PhD in 2006 uh, in building low-cost computing hardware. The other is my experience as a director of studies here between 2004 and 2007, where I was one of several people who noticed that there'd been a massive decline in the number of people applying to study computer science here at Cambridge. There was a feeling that if we could get um, a programmable piece of hardware of the sort I was building into the hands of young people at the right point in their lives, we might be able to do something to reverse that decline. We're about 10 years into the story of Raspberry Pi now, uh, and we've shipped about 40 million Raspberry Pis, but it's interesting to remember how parochial our ambitions were early on. Uh, one of our first thoughts was, well, people in year 12 come to open days at the department. What if we gave them a computer? What if that was how we got computers into people's hands? We'll give you a computer in June, and then when you come for interview in December, A, you're more likely to come for interview in December, and when you come to interview, we have something to talk about. We can ask you, what did you do with the computer? If you say you did nothing with it, you're probably not the right person for the course. Um, and if you have done something with it, then we have a common platform to talk about. I had a BBC Micro when I was a child. It's the very first computer I had. It's one of two great Cambridge-designed uh, computers, along with the Sinclair Spectrum. Uh, now, the idea of redoing the BBC Micro was an important, I guess it was an important part of the Raspberry Pi story. There were email threads, particularly in the context of, I think, a proposal that MIT were going to clone the Apple II. Um, there was an email thread that went round here at Cambridge saying, well, this is, this, is, this is terrible, right? If MIT can do this, why can't we do the BBC Micro? And so Raspberry Pi, you can see it maybe as the confluence of three things, the confluence of my interest in low-cost hardware, the general interest in bolstering um, student numbers, uh, and this idea that if anyone's going to make a successor to the great computers of the 1980s, it should probably be Cambridge. The first thing I built that you could really consider to be a Raspberry Pi um, was back in 2006, uh, in the aftermath of my PhD. Now, this was built out of uh, microcontroller, about $10 of microcontroller components. Um, it had roughly the same level of performance as the machine I had, the Commodore Amiga that I had when I was a teenager. It was certainly an exciting platform for me, and it was certainly programmable. But the concern we had was that it wasn't really, from the point of view of addressing the, uh, the applicant shortage, um, there was such a big gap between its performance and the performance of contemporary computer hardware um, that we worried children wouldn't, engage, wouldn't really engage with it properly. Um, the next five or six years to 2011 when we first publicly talked about Raspberry Pi and 2012 when we launched the product is really about trying to bridge that gap, trying to find a thing which is both affordable and has a contemporary level of performance. By 2011 we had this, and this is a Raspberry Pi, what we call an alpha board. This is the first um, product that's actually built for us by Broadcom, who are our chip vendor, um, and this is the first product uh, that would actually run the real Raspberry Pi operating system. If you go and download a Raspberry Pi operating system image today, it'll run on this board. And there were 50 of these. I had a spreadsheet that told me where every single Raspberry Pi in the world was. Raspberry Pi's journey from that first prototype in 2006 to the launch of the product in 2012 um, is in a lot of ways about trying to satisfy this set of four interlocking requirements that we came up with really very, very early on. The first one obviously is that it should be programmable. We're trying to build a programmable piece of hardware. 
The second is that we're trying to build a fun piece of hardware. The Sinclair Spectrum, lots of children used to buy that to play computer games on, purely to play computer games on, and then they were then beguiled into programming. And we had, for us, what did fun mean? Uh, it meant can render 3D graphics, it meant can play video, it meant can run a web browser, can do all of the things that young people might expect from a PC. Uh, the third was affordability. Uh, we settled on the price point of $25. Why $25? Because that was our idea of what a school textbook cost. That's cheap enough that most families can afford it uh, and that schools can afford to, to subsidise the small number of families who can't. And then the last one, which I guess interlocks with that previous requirement, is one of robustness. We really wanted children to own this. I owned my BBC Micro and my ownership of it was a big part of my relationship with my computer as a child. So we wanted children to own it and we wanted them to be able to put that computer into their school bag and take it out a thousand times. It's actually that last requirement, I think, that stood us in very good stead in the industrial space uh, of the 40 million Raspberry Pis we've sold. Many, many of them are in use in industrial contexts, and there's still this kind of like question in our minds of, is a child's bedroom or an oil rig a more brutal environment to try to use a computer in? Thanks to the success of the Raspberry Pi, the product, and Raspberry Pi, the business, the Raspberry Pi Foundation has been able to pursue, I guess, a much broader range of edu educational activities than we first imagined. So it's a member of the consortium that delivers the government's National Centre for Computing Education teacher training programme. Um, it runs two large networks of after-school clubs, Coda Dojo and Code Club, uh, and it produces a very broad range of, uh, of online resources to support um, teachers and to support self-directed learning. Um, one of the wonderful things about Raspberry Pi um, has been that we really weren't the only people to perceive this problem. And so as we've made progress, probably when we were talking about this in 2007, 2008, we felt a little bit like a vo voice in the wilderness. By the time we really started deploying Raspberry Pis at scale in 2012, there were a lot of other organisations doing the same thing. And so it's been wonderful to be part of a coalition that's really delivered curriculum reform, teacher training reform, um, a revival in hobbyist computing to level levels, I think, to, to numbers beyond what we had in the 1980s, and with a much better demographic balance than we ever saw in the 1980s. Um, I think this is reflected in the applicant numbers, uh, where we, you know, are, are at the start of Raspberry Pi, really, our story was one of doom and gloom and of a collapse in applicant numbers from the late 1990s down to, I think, an Adir in 2008. Um, roughly 600 to 200. Last year, I believe, roughly 1,400 applicants. Um, it's, it's not something Raspberry Pi can um, claim full or even the majority of the responsibility for, um, but it's been wonderful to be part of a community and a consortium that's been able to deliver that kind of change over the course of a decade.